Well, these uh, these positions are presidential appointments. I was contacted because of my career in the airline industry, not not because of a particular political activity. They were looking with some, for someone who had some deep business experience, and the focus really was on next gen and the upgrade of the air traffic control system. So they wanted somebody with a business background that could bring some business principles to that really important project. You just heard Mike Whitaker, the nominee for FAA Administrator, talking about his former job as the FAA Deputy Administrator. Hello again, and welcome to Aviation News Talk, where we talk general aviation with relevant news and flying tips for pilots and student pilots to help keep you safe. I'm Max Truscott. In a moment, you'll hear the entire interview in which Mike also talked about his activity as a private pilot, his thoughts on NextGen, and the future of general aviation. Mike talked about factors that led to the decline of GA after the 1970s and his optimism for further growth due to demand for more pilots, the Part 23 rewrite, and new technologies like electric aircraft. He also talked about NextGen, ADSB, and his prop strike. I had this conversation with Mike in 2019, and this is a replay of Episode 115 of the Aviation News Talk podcast. A few years earlier, when Mike was still the FAA Deputy Administrator, I spent the afternoon with him, and I had planned to take him for his first ride in a Cirrus aircraft. And I'll tell you after the interview why we didn't fly and what we did instead. Earlier this week, in episode 290, we talked with Robert Shapiro about what it takes for you as a fixed-wing pilot or as a helicopter pilot to add on a rating to fly a gyroplane. So if you didn't hear that episode, you may want to check it out at aviationnewstalk.com slash 290. And so you don't miss next week's episode. In whatever app that you're using to listen to me now, take a moment right now and touch either the subscribe key or, if you're using the Apple Podcast app, the follow key so that next week's episode is downloaded for free. And this is a listener-supported show, supported by people like, well, yeah, you. So to join the club and become a member who supports the show, go on out to aviationnewstalk.com slash awesome. And if I sound ever so slightly different, it's because I'm recording this from my hotel room right across the highway from the Northern Colorado Regional Airport that serves Fort Collins and Loveland, Colorado. And it's one of two airports here in the U.S. that have had a remote tower. And I'll tell you more about that in the future. Now here's our conversation with Mike Whitaker. And now let me tell you a little bit about Mike Whitaker. Mike has a long history of working in the aviation industry, and he also has a special interest in general aviation, which we'll be talking about today. When he became a lawyer, he opened a private practice representing GA manufacturers. Later, he went to TWA, then United Airlines, and in 2009, he became Group CEO of Interglobe Enterprises, India's largest travel conglomerate and operator of Indigo Airlines. In 2013, Mike was appointed by the president to serve as deputy administrator of the FAA, where he served as chief next-gen officer and was responsible for the development and implementation of the FAA's next-generation air traffic control. He left the FAA in 2016 and now advises airline and aerospace companies and is a keynote speaker. Mike, welcome to the show. I'm excited to have you here. Thanks, Max. It's great to be here. I, I enjoy your podcast and glad to be part of it. Well, thanks so much. We had a great time uh, when you came out here a few years ago, spent the afternoon together, and uh, you spoke at one of the presentations that we'd set up here. I wanted to just kind of go back a little bit. I know that um, you have got your private pilot's license a couple years ago, but you were also the deputy administrator for the FAA. Tell us a little bit about what that job was all about. Well, Max, I did both at the same time. I became deputy administrator, and part of my job was being in charge of the upgrading of the air traffic control system. And I was not a pilot at the time, and I felt like to really understand the system, I needed to just not understand it at a theoretical level, but actually operate in the system. So I started the process, started working toward my private. And, you know, it was a very interesting thing to go through. And as a deputy administrator, I realized as I went along the process that it would be very embarrassing if I didn't pass the check ride. So it had a little extra pressure, but it was a, it was a great experience and really allowed me to understand the system much better. So how does one become deputy FAA administrator? Well, these, uh, these positions are presidential appointments. I was contacted because of my career in the airline industry, not, not because of a particular political activity. They were looking with some, for someone who had some deep business experience. And the focus really was on next gen and the upgrade of the air traffic control system. So they wanted somebody with a business background that could bring some business principles to that really important project. 
And as deputy administrator, are you kind of like the vice president or tell us what uh, that role is like? Well, it's the number two role and working closely with Administrator Huerta. And we had some areas where uh, he worked on on his things and I worked on my things. NextGen was sort of an example of that. But mostly we worked very closely as a team and would decide how to allocate work and worked in, very closely uh, in conjunction with each other on NextGen, on uh, safety certification, and ultimately on drones, which became a, a very hot issue while we were there. Hmm. Yeah, I remember in your presentation, you talked about the number of uh, people who had registered with drone owners and how long those drones tend to last. Tell us about that. <laughs> it's true at the time. I don't know if the statistic still holds true, but at the time, the average drone completed 1.5 flights. And that's actually consistent with my own experience of people who've owned drones. The first, first flight goes well, and then the second one you know, in, interrupts a tree or or a building and uh, doesn't end quite as well. So, but it is a, it is a technology that has just taken over and just hundreds of thousands and millions of these things coming onto the private and commercial scene going forward. Yeah. I had to laugh when you uh, use that particular line in your presentation, because I've had similar experience. I've probably owned four or five drones. <laughs> they, they, right. they do seem to have a magnetic attraction to trees. Yeah, you don't need planned ob obsolescence if you're just going <laughs> to crash on the second try. So <laughs> That's great. Hey, so what was it like getting your private while being the number two guy at the FAA? Was that kind of like being in a fishbowl? You know, it really was. And I, I, I tried to kind of keep it under wraps. But eventually somebody asked you a question, inevitably, about your flying. And so, you know, I flew from a little airport called Freeway Airport uh, just outside of Washington, D.C., so you're right in the controlled airspace, the special use airspace. You've got to get a squat code to take off. Um, you're constantly with ATC. It's a, a pretty small airport with a, about a 2,500-foot runway. So it's a little interesting, but it, it, was, it was a great experience. And I had a great instructor and great folks there at the airport. And when you were out flying around, did you have a feeling that uh, the folks you were talking to knew it was you? There was definitely a feeling that uh, I was being uh, carefully watched, and my instructor and I would discuss this, and he, he thought I was being a little bit paranoid, but one time we were about to take off, and I called to get my squat code, and they gave me a squat code of 0001, so I felt like somebody was messing with me there. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I think probably somebody knew. I mean, that's probably a big deal when uh, the, the number two guy is out flying around there. So. I know that at one point in time, you had some kind of incident that occurred where you had to file reports with the FAA and NTSB, and I know nothing about the details about that. Tell, tell us what happened. Well, after I received my license, you know, there's always the question, what do you do with it once you get it? Because you've gone through all this structured training. So soon after I had my certificate, I made a cross-country trip from my local airport all the way up to New England, where I call home. And it was, a, it was quite a long flight. It was uh, about a four-hour flight. I did it in two legs coming up to Lebanon, New Hampshire, and then one leg going back into a, such a stiff headwind that I would look down and see cars passing me on the interstate below. Mm. So I had to make a fuel stop on the way back. It was about a four-and-a-half-hour flight and pretty gusty winds. And I would say, in retrospect, I was a bit uh, over my head in that type of a, a trip at that point. But coming back through the, the airspace and making a landing at freeway, uh, I ended up doing a, a go around as I came in a little bit fast and, and high and executed a go around and the second time came around and again, a little bit fast and high, but decided it was time to put it on the runway. And, you know, that's what I did, including the prop. So uh, had a little por porpoising episode down the runway, hit, a, hit the prop. And fortunately, nobody was hurt except for the, the airplane. Taxied off to the side of the runway and had it towed into the into the hangar. But because it was a, po a prop strike, it was a little bit in a gray area, but in the, an abundance of caution reported to the NTSB and to the FAA. So I was in the uh, unusual position of being the number two guy at FAA and now being investigated by the FAA for not being a very good pilot. So 
it was, uh, to say the least, an interesting experience to go through receiving the certified letters, having an interview with the local FISDO, and then ultimately having a check ride with the FAA to make sure I was still proficient to fly. So I put it in the bucket of uh, learning experience, and uh, certainly I learned a lot uh, from that experience and did a lot of training and certainly understand how to land an airplane a lot better now than I did then. Well, if it makes you feel any better, I can think of three local pilots over the last mm, three, four years that either I have flown with or that I knew reasonably well who've had prop strikes. So not terribly uh, unusual. If you're thinking back about it, what were some of the factors that led to that? I mean, what what do you think contributed to that happening? Well, the, I, th- I think there are a number of things. One is the wind was a little more than I was used to. And as I did a little research on the fly, I came up with this you know, rule of thumb that you should add half the gust to your landing airspeed. So I put a little extra airspeed in there when I probably didn't really need it. And a little, certainly fatigue after four, four and a half hours and, and sort of inexperience. So, and I think fundamentally, I didn't realize you can't force the airplane onto the runway. It's really got to settle down on its own free will. So, you know, a, a variety of factors that became clear to me as as I continued my training and got some special focus on landing. Hmm. Yep. Well, that's good. And thanks for sharing that because I think we all profit from that. And do you think there was any kind of sense of, hey, you know, get there, itis, I've just got to get this done. Let's end this now. I, I think absolutely after a long, a long flight like that. And I think the conditions were fine for landing. I just was at that point had too much speed on the airplane and just not sort of in that space where you're you've got everything in a nice stable approach at the right speeds coming in and just letting the airplane do its thing. Mm-hmm. So it's something that comes with experience. Yeah, and I, I think sometimes that with these uh, first few really long trips, uh, pilots are just not fully aware of how much fatigue can be a factor and how challenging it can be to to land at the end of one of those trips. Right, and if you don't have autopilot and you're so you're you know and it's a bit of a choppy trip. It can be pretty tiring after a few hours of that. Yeah, no question. Autopilots are great, and <laughs> turbulence definitely uh, can enhance the fatigue even more. Right. Well, let's talk a little bit about uh, general aviation, some of the history, and then a little bit of the future. I mean, everybody kind of talks about the good old days, the 70s. Wow, we built lots of airplanes back then. I know you've done some research into that. Tell us how you came to get interested in this and research that you've done. You know, the numbers around general aviation are pretty staggering. When you look at the decline in the number of aircraft that have been manufactured and the the decline in number of pilots, and it's something that I was very focused on trying to understand when I was was at FAA, were there things that, that the government could do to help this situation? You know, what is the actual cause? And I guess after a lot of looking, I hate to use the term perfect storm, but there were an awful lot of factors that came together to lead to the decline of, of aviation. There, you know, there was the product liability problems that happened with some big lawsuits over manufacturing where one statistic back in the 80s, the average aircraft cost, there was about $1,300 attributed to liability insurance. After some of these lawsuits, that number went to over $100,000. So that's adding a very significant cost to aircraft. But, you know, there, there's also airline deregulation. The, the rise of Southwest Airlines meant that you could fly to Florida on vacation for $89. It's a lot harder to justify owning an airplane. Back in the 70s and 80s, those, those airplane tickets were dramatically more expensive. So if you had a family of five, you could probably make the math work to justify an aircraft a little easier. And then there's the demographic issue. I mean, a lot of us are getting older and the younger generation is just not able to perhaps afford the the cost of flight training or disinclined to do it. I think there was just a big bubble of pilots after the war and the GI Bill. So these various changes have come to to pass and and it has really uh, dramatically reduced the number of aircraft that are built in this country and the number of pilots that we have. And you had mentioned a couple of other factors in a presentation that I saw that you gave you talked about affordability. Tell us about that a little bit. Yeah, affordability is, I think if, if, if you're like me, if you grew up in the, in the 70s, 
you know, you had friends whose, whose parents had airplanes or maybe the local doctor had an airplane. And the cost of an airplane was, was not that far out of reach for somebody who was upper middle class income. But you look at uh, the income disparity now and the sort of the squeezing of, of that category of, of earnings, it's just a lot harder for uh, a physician, for example, to afford an airplane on the average physician salary today than it was back at that time. So it just has become a much more expensive hobby and fewer people in that category who can really afford it. Yeah, and I saw a note that in the 1970s, there were 88,000 airplanes produced. Obviously, we're building many fewer of those. So I guess costs are going up, but, but wages aren't. Well, and that's another, that's another factor. If airplanes were as common as automobiles, and instead of producing 1,000 a year, we were producing 100,000 a year, you'd be able to get a much lower unit cost. But with those relatively small numbers, it means that the airplanes are going to be pretty expensive. Mm-hmm. Now, let's talk a little bit about technology. I know there's been quite a bit of a shift from what's being built in general aviation from uh, pistons to turbines. So the, I think the, the, I mean, there's a lot going on on the technology front these days. And of course, the automation that we've seen in aircraft, just really amazing technology that you can have in, in your typical GA aircraft just with your iPad that commercial airline pilots didn't have 10 years ago. But I think the, to me, the thing I get the most excited about is electric propulsion. And if you look at the things that are likely to change the landscape for general aviation, I would point at electric propulsion. If you look at what's happened with cars going from piston engines to hybrid electrics to now electrics, if you have that same transition in aircraft, you can really change the economics of general aviation. Pipistrelle, you probably know, has an electric trainer out. It claims that it's $3 an hour of electricity to run. So you compare that to a Cessna 172 where you're going to spend 50 bucks an hour or more just on fuel. You know, it could be, it could be a, a significant game changer. It was reported at the Paris Air Show that there are over 170 companies now making, trying to make electric or hybrid electric airplanes. That's a lot of people, that's a lot of capital flowing into this space. So I think that's a pretty pretty exciting development coming up, coming down the pike. Oh, I agree. I see it helping in a lot of different areas closer to what I'm doing in flight training. I think it's going to make the cost of uh, flying around the pattern and practicing landings much, much, much less expensive. Now, with right. 170 companies, let's you know kind of look forward 20, 25 years from now. How many of those do you think will be in business shipping aircraft? Well, I think clearly the majority won't be in business. I think that the interesting thing is the number of companies that are that are trying it. And these range from, there's a company in Burlington, Vermont, near where I live, that's got a secret project going on in a hangar where they're retrofitting an old twin to make it electric, all the way up to the Airbuses and the Boeings that are working on this kind of stuff. So someone's going to get it right. And... You know, there's plenty of room for competition out there. And if someone comes up with a reasonably priced hydro, you know, hybrid electric, and, you know, there's some, there's some safety benefits in this technology, just redundancy of having uh, electric as well as piston in the same aircraft. I mean, there are really some, 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 some advantages that, that could come both in safety and clearly on the cost side. Mm-hmm. I'm thinking that project in Burlington isn't secret anymore. <laughs> I think I did see a photo, yeah. <laughs> no, I think you just told everybody about it. Uh, right, right. No, now I'll get everybody out there Googling it. <laughs> well, that's good. Yeah, I, I agree. I think uh, electric uh, propulsion is very, very exciting. I watched a demonstration back in 2011 at Oshkosh. I saw a, a laser experimental aircraft that was being used to, to fly in electricity, which really captured my imagination. Let's talk about experimental aircraft a little bit. How's that changed over the years, and what do you think their contribution is? Well, I think, of course, you got to put in a plug for Oshkosh. It's the most fun you can possibly have in this in this in this area. But I think I think experimental has has been a huge contributor. I think you've seen it on the avionics side, and and you realize from experimental how how low cost avionics can actually be, and I think it's created a lot of pressure to lower the cost for avionics. And I think it's helped 
FAA and its thinking to move toward the Part 23 philosophy of really allowing certificated products to get out faster, like light sport and like what we're seeing, sort of a surge in turbines. It's it's good to see movement in all of those areas, and it's just it's more technology development that can happen and be cross pollinated with other sectors of the business. Now, I wanted to ask you about what kinds of things the FAA has done in recent years to help improve the climate for general aviation. And you brought up Part 23. I'm sure that's part of it. Tell us, you know, kind of in, in real basic terms, what Part 23 is. Well, Part 23 is designed to, to really recognize that it's not helpful for the government to try to specify every design feature of an aircraft. And rather than have a very prescriptive approach to regulation, basically have industry standards that say, if you're going to build this aircraft, it needs to be able to meet these performance metrics. And as long as you can meet those performance metrics and reliability and durability, you can get certificated uh, in a more expedited, more flexible way. It doesn't reduce the level of safety. I think you can argue it actually enhances safety, but it's a much lighter touch. And I think it's been a very successful approach. Part 23 applies to general aviation. I think that same approach will move throughout the various sectors in aviation that FAA regulates. The problem is it takes an awfully long time to rewrite an entire regulatory scheme, but I think it was a very successful first step. Mm -hmm. And let's talk a little bit about safety. You had mentioned one time about how the uh, CAST team, the Commercial Aviation Safety Team, had brought down accident rates. Tell us about that program and how you think things like that might be applied to general aviation. Well, I think it's it's part of a uh, sort of a broader theme that we've seen between FAA and industry over the years. That the, the more FAA and industry and pilots can work together on a problem, and the less of a sort of adversarial relationship, the you know the better result that you get. So the cast reporting has been very effective in identifying anomalies that airlines and cargo carriers experience but weren't reporting before. But if you get a a broad group of these operators reporting anomalies, sometimes you can find patterns far far before there's a problem. And that's really what you want. You want as much data as you can get, and you want to analyze that data effectively so you can bring safety to a much earlier level in the process. So if you think back to the old days, there'd be a plane crash, you would investigate the plane crash, you'd come up with a fix, now it's much more about identifying issues way before they become uh, a problem. Hmm. Yeah, and I think we're probably aware of some of the issues within uh, general aviation that are problems. And yet I'm just not sure that low time private pilots are, are learning about those issues. And we've just kind of talked about, you know, one very simple one, you know, flying on a long trip. I, I think, for example, I continually read about folks that take off at night, but they've been a private for six months and they're out there in the clouds or maybe the mountains and so on. I mean, how do we help educate low time pilots to, you know, some of these issues that are obvious to those of us who've been around for a while? Yeah, that's, that is a challenge. And I think part of that challenge, I, I think gets met by things like Oshkosh and the activities of AOPA and others to raise awareness and, and have that, have education be a continuous thing. I think from the FAA point of view, and, and I'm, perhaps a poster child for this. The FAA has migrated from an enforcement mentality to a compliance mentality. So if you have a pilot who makes a mistake because they're a little rusty, it doesn't really make sense to ground them and let them become even more rusty, right? Really what you want to do is make sure that the pilot's skills and proficiencies are there. So the focus has shifted for FAA to with, with pilots who aren't intentionally doing bad things, they're simply making mistakes, often due to lack of experience, FAA's focus has changed to bringing those pilots into compliance rather than sort of punishing them in the traditional way. And I guess what that means is you're less likely to uh, face a suspension of your license if you do have a problem? Exactly. Yeah, that makes, that makes a big difference. Uh, tell us a little bit about uh, NORSI and Tech Refresh and how that applies to uh, general aviation companies. Well, I think that's another example of really working with industry to try to have a practical approach to avionics and to safety. So 
I think angle of attack indicator is probably the best example. You know, it's not a required piece of safety equipment for general aviation. So do you really have to have the normal high standards for certification to have an angle of attack indicator in your aircraft? And I think the conclusions that certainly industry reached and the FAA ultimately reached is no. And in that situation, you need to have a more flexible pathway for avionics and for equipage. And angle of attack is a great example of that. The cost of equipage went down dramatically. As you know, when you go through an air show, you can find all kinds of angle of attack indicators you can install in your aircraft in a pretty straightforward way. It's a great safety enhancement. It's hard to quantify the impact that it's had, but I think the sense is that having an angle of attack indicator in your aircraft is a is an excellent safety enhancing device, and NORSI is designed to make that possible. And I should explain that NORSI is N-O-R-S-E-E, non-required safety enhancing equipment, and just tell us briefly what that project or program is or was. So NORSI, we have to have an acronym for everything, as you say. Uh, And it's really just a streamlined certification process that just lightens the requirements for manufacturing and also installing that equipment. So we've talked a lot about uh, GA and, you know, how things have changed in the past, how the, you know, change in liability and affordability and, you know, alternate transportation with deregulation of all kind of effective GA negatively from its peak back in the 70s. Looking forward what kinds of things do you think that we as individual you know, private pilots could be doing to help assure the future of GA? Well, that's a great question, and there's, there's not an easy answer to that. I think we, we all know we have a, a big demographic bubble of, of retiring pilots trying to get the, the next generation uh, enthusiastic about aviation, I think, is our mission. And when I occasionally speak with, with students it's pretty easy for me to get excited about the career path for pilots these days. I mean, for for most of my career, my pilot friends went through furloughs and changed airlines and went from mainline back to commuter. These days, with the pilot shortage, you can move pretty quickly through the ranks into a really excellent uh, career with a lot of flexibility. And it's not just for pilots, it's also for uh, aerospace engineers and other professionals in this space. So, it's an, it's an excellent time to get in the business. And I think if you compare pilot training to other educational costs, it's a pretty reasonable avenue that pays back uh, pretty consistently going forward. Yeah, I'm surprised. I've seen a number of posts here just in the last few days on Facebook with newly promoted captains talking about you know their path. One of them was a lady, I think she had started flying lessons four and a half years ago. She's now a captain at a regional airline. That's just a phenomenal uh, you know, trajectory. Yeah, and I think people are coming out of the aeronautical university programs pretty much directly into regional carriers now and then moving right up and, and finding openings in the, in the mainline car- carrier. So it's a, it's a really, really solid uh, career path. And just given the demographics going forward, uh, I think it's, it's going to be a pretty solid career path for quite a while. Mm-hmm. Now you're talking about uh, inspiring the uh, the next generation. It seems to me that when kids are somewhere, oh, I don't know, 12, 13, 14, they, they get the bug. Certainly that's that's what I did. And not all the people who get the bug are going to become airline pilots, but they may just be you know out there having fun like you and I. What kinds of things do we do to uh, grab those teenagers or, or preteens and get them interested? Well, and you know, drones are perhaps going to be a key to this. I think the line between being a pilot and not being a pilot it gets a little bit blurred as we now have this category called drone pilot w- with increased automation in the aircraft some of the new technologies that you're seeing proposed while i remain skeptical about flying cars i do think we're we're going to continue to see automation happen in ways where you have single pilot operations that can function autonomously so i think the array of positions that'll be available uh, is really going to open up pretty dramatically in the next decade or so. Hmm. Well, let's shift gears a little bit and uh, kind of come back to your role as uh, you know, chief next gen officer when you were at the FAA. Tell us about some of those programs and uh, you know what GA pilots should be thinking about. Yeah, the the next gen program really was what drove me to join FAA. Uh, it was a twenty billion dollar program to upgrade the air traffic control system, 
which, you know, is a 24 seven high stakes operation that you can't just sort of shut down and build a new one. So you have to do it on the fly. It's, it takes a long time, but there's been really significant pro- progress. And I, I think you could safely say that next gen is, is, is wrapping up the core piece of next gen was the ADSB technology that gives controllers a better technology than radar. It allows them to see your aircraft more frequently and more accurately and really replace radar or in areas where you don't have radar, give you, give the controllers coverage. So that system, the, the technology was installed in all the towers in all the centers, all the TRACONs. And of course, by January of next year, all aircraft have to be equipped with ADSB. So that's a pretty substantial, though gradual, change in the system. I mean, there are some other pieces of next gen. There's a data comm that allows sort of data communications to cockpits, from, uh, particularly with airliners. But I think ADSB is really the cornerstone of, of that program. You know, the data comm to airliners, that's something I've actually seen now with the advanced versions of uh, Four Flight. I think the, the $300 version. Right. And, and, you know, we all want to get our clearances, you know, through a data source so we can put push accept and have it go right into our flight director, but we're not quite there yet across the board, but it is it is coming. Well, then certainly we're already pioneering clearances coming digitally to, to GA pilots uh, through the airlines. Let's go way far into the future. Do you think we'll replace voice communications at some point? Is it possible that we'll be interacting with air traffic control when we're in the air via text message? I think that what you'll see is a gradual reduction in the necessity of voice communication. So if you if you no longer have to call for your clearance and you can receive it electronically, then you, you've eliminated one category of, of very error-ridden voice communication, which is good. And eventually, as the tracking improves and the a- avionics improves, you wonder if it's going to be necessary to have quite as much communication en route. But you know, one thing I will say is that working with the air traffic controllers when I was at, at FAA, working on NextGen, they never resisted adopting these new technologies, they never had fear that it was going to put them out of jobs because the rate of change happens so slowly. And almost every program you put in place has a very strong safety case for it and generally gets very broad support by the air traffic controllers. But you have to think, if not in 10 years, certainly in 50 years, there'll be an awful lot less voice communication out there in the system. Yeah, I think that would save a lot of the congestion we hear sometimes where people are stepping on each other and it's just hard to get a word through edgewise. So That's right. Yeah, I think that makes a lot of sense. Well, we know that you have your private. Uh, what's next for you in the general aviation world? Well, I've been working for the past six or eight months on my instrument rating. Got a terrific instructor, former uh, 747 captain uh, with United Airlines. And so getting the getting the real professional view of, of the process. And I'd say we're about 75% through the process. And it has been, it's been like going back to school and getting a master's degree. The, the amount of information. And of course, you know, as a pilot, everything feels like it's crucial and you have to understand everything. And, you know, particularly on the weather front, as you get your instrument rating, weather obviously takes on a whole new dimension of importance. So it's been a quite a project, quite a workload, but uh, very satisfying and hoping to get that completed uh, later this summer. Well, I have to say instruments is my favorite topic to teach. And, and you're right. I think probably the big difference between instruments, I, I think it's more of a, a mental game and getting your privates kind of more of a physical manipulating the controls game. That's right. It, it really is a very taxing on the brain and it brings into very clear focus the phrase of getting in front of the airplane. <laughs> so staying, staying up on, on your work. And then the you know the weather is its own. I would, in my in my view, the the instrument rating is sort of fifty percent weather and fifty percent uh, flying. But it's you know nothing could be more important than understanding the weather. So yeah, and and another fifty percent deciding whether or not to go into that weather at all. Right. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah, that was my biggest misconception as a as an instrument pilot. I just kind of thought, oh, this is an all weather rating. And what I learned rather quickly is no, this is <laughs> right. That's right. <laughs> Yeah, you quickly learn that they're just places you don't want to be. And and for me, I'll I'll put in a small plug here. I really felt like I needed to understand weather from the very basic point of view. And FAA 
does put out some really excellent handbooks on a variety of topics on how to fly airplanes and how to fly instruments. But their weather handbook is really a, a very valuable resource. It really practically goes back to the Big Bang and takes you all the way through to predicting thunderstorms. So it's a really good, comprehensive review of weather. Yes. And uh, another one would be the, the weather services book from, from FAA. So that dives down even deeper with all the, all the charts and legends and detail. Right. Yeah. The FAA books are great. Uh, I used them, gosh, 40 years ago plus when I was working on my private and I still recommend them today. They've been updated. Yeah. They're so, they're so comprehensive. They really just cover, if you have a, a obscure question, you can find it in one of those handbooks. You know what? I'm going to put a link to that in the show notes so that anybody who wants to find them can uh, just go ahead right. and click and find a free PDF with uh, with all this information. Well, now that you're no longer with the FAA, what kinds of things are you doing in the uh, aviation industry? What keeps you busy these days now? Well, I do I do some consulting f- for some airlines and aerospace companies and sit on a couple of boards. And so I manage to stay stay very involved with what's going on, particularly on the drone front. It, it wasn't what I intended to get involved with uh, in this field. But just from my time at FAA, drones went from being about 0% of what I was focused on to being almost half of what I was focused on. So that technology is is moving very quickly. And a lot of big name companies are trying very hard to get it in in a big way. So um, a lot of challenges for regulators on how to integrate this technology in a safe fashion. So it's a pretty, pretty active area. Well, Mike, we have covered just a wide range of topics here. Where do people go to find out more about you and what you're doing these days? Well, I'm, uh, I have a website, Whitaker Airspace, so you can get the basics on there. But uh, I'm staying active. I, I speak at conferences and stay involved with some aerospace companies, large and small, to, to keep up on what's going on in the field. And I'll go ahead and put a link in the show notes here to your website, WhitakerAirspace.com. Mike, I want to thank you so much for your time today. This has uh, really been illuminating and hope to have you back sometime. Great, Max. Thanks for having me. And I really appreciate your, your podcast. It's doing, doing a lot of good in this space. Well, it's great having someone such as Mike, who's so experienced in so many different aspects of aviation, working in our industry to help make it better. If you're looking for a keynote speaker or advisor to an aviation company, look him up at WhitakerAirspace.com. And I got to tell you, he was out here for a presentation that I set up a few years ago. And we were going to go flying in an airplane together, and it was just so windy we didn't. So we just decided on the spur of the moment, hey, let's go visit the tower at the Palo Alto Airport. So there we marched on in and said hello. And I think people were a little surprised that their uh, boss's 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 boss showed up to say hello. But uh, it worked out incredibly well, and uh, we certainly had a great time uh, together when he was out here. So Mike's a great guy, and I want to thank him for coming on the show. And that was from episode 115. I hope you enjoyed it and that it gave you some insights into the nominee for the FAA administrator. Now, I've been privileged over the years to have met two FAA administrators and one acting FAA administrator while they were in their jobs, having met them and knowing Mike, I think he is the right person for the job, and I hope he's confirmed by the Senate. If you have feedback or insights about this episode or anything else you'd like to share, please go to aviationnewstalk.com, click on contact at the top of the page, and send me an email. And I'll read some of those emails on a future show. And please take a moment to share this episode with a friend who you feel may enjoy it, as that's the primary way that we grow our audience. And if you've been learning things from this show and listening for a while, please consider supporting the show by sending in a donation. Just join the club and become a member by going out to aviationnewstalk.com slash awesome and choose the dollar amount you'd like to pledge to support the show. Or you can make a one-time donation at aviationnewstalk.com slash PayPal. And thanks to everyone who supports the show in whatever way you do. So until next time, fly safely, have fun, and keep the blue side up. And remember, sometimes you should go around. You can always go around. If it don't look right, coming down. Don't wait until your side may be sliding upside down.